So if you've been on social media or anywhere on the internet really in the last few days, you've probably seen a lot of headlines about dire wolves are back or howling for the first time in 10,000 years. As apparently, Colossal Biosciences, an organization that's famously been working on bringing back the thylacine and the woolly mammoth, successfully cloned some dire wolves. But did they really? Well, they kinda-ish maybe did. But let's take a quick look and dive a little deeper. So Colossal, what did they do and how did they do it? A lot of dire wolf fossils have been found in the La Brea tar pits in California, but apparently there wasn't really good DNA samples to take from there. But luckily for Colossal, they were able to get dire wolf samples from an international study and they were able to recover more DNA. Apparently they used a 13,000 year old tooth and a 72,000 year old ear bone and were able to sequence the DNA. And specifically, they were able to look for differences between dire wolves and grey wolves. Then, they used CRISPR technology, which can edit genes, and they edited genomes of a grey wolf. Specifically, they made about 20 alterations to make it more dire wolf-like. This included making it larger, with a broader head, and thicker white fur. When they had the edited genetic material, they put it into an egg cell from a domestic dog. Then, when the embryos were developed, they put them into surrogate dogs. And about 62 days later, they got some wolves. There are three so far, Romulus and Ramus, born in October of 2024, and Khaleesi, named from Game of Thrones of course, born on January 30th, 2025. Cool, so what is the issue? We have three dire wolves, right? Well, it was a little odd to me at first that they decided to go with grey wolves and use grey wolf DNA because, well, dire wolves weren't actually wolves. Dire wolves were a species of animal that went extinct about 12 to 13,000 years ago. While their common name is still dire wolf, a study in 2021 examining the mitochondrial DNA of dire wolves discovered they diverged from the lineage of true wolves about 5.6 million years ago. In fact, the researchers suggested removing the dire wolf from the genus Canis and suggested instead the genus Enoceon meaning terrible wolf. That 2021 paper also stated that canids like wolves and coyotes can create hybrids. Dire wolves couldn't make hybrids, at least not with any other canids that remain alive today. In fact, that might have been part of the reason they went extinct. Quote, hybridization couldn't provide a way out because dire wolves were probably unable to produce viable offspring with the recently arrived wolves from Eurasia. Since they were somewhat different genetically, does a few modifications of a grey wolf really count? The thing is, it is difficult to say how many differences there really are. Colossal Biosciences haven't released the complete sequenced genome of the dire wolf yet, but Beth Shapiro from Colossal said the two species share 99.5% DNA, which sounds like a lot. But as new scientists pointed out, in an article, the grey wolf genome is around 2.4 billion base pairs long. That still leaves room for millions of base pairs of differences. Not only that, but remember the 20 modifications they made to make them more like dire wolves? Well, Beth Shapiro also stated in the interview that five of those 20 changes are based on mutations known to produce light coats in grey wolves. So really, there are only 15 changes based on the dire wolf genome directly. Which, when I first read the story, it sounded like they had genetically engineered some grey wolves to superficially look kind of like dire wolves, but hadn't really brought the dire wolf back. That's not to try and take away from anything that they have done. I think it is a very impressive achievement. I just, I don't know if it's correct to call these animals dire wolves. And some scientists are disputing that they should be called dire wolves. If you read the interview on New Scientists, this question is kind of put to Beth Shapiro. And it almost sounds like this is a bit of a touchy subject, maybe. She said that it all comes down to how you define species and quote, species concept are human classification systems and everybody can disagree and everyone can be right. She then went on to say, you can use the phylogenetic species concept to determine what you're going to call a species, which is what you are implying, but then stated, we are using the morphological species concept and saying, if they look like this animal, then they are the animal. And I mean, who am I to say anything really? I'm just trying to learn more about classification systems that we use. But from what I've read, it seems that 
phylogenetics nowadays is the more accepted way to determine species rather than morphology. So just really quickly, phylogenetics is more classifying organisms based on evolutionary history and their genetic relationships. So we could use DNA analysis to determine their ancestry. But then morphology categorizes them based on how they look, their physical traits and their structure. And this was used a lot more before phylogenetics became more dominant. For me, I kind of think of morphology as a good start. Physical similarities can certainly be a good basis and they can be useful, especially for fossils. But phylogenetics, again, looking at like genetic data and the DNA, seems like a more reliable way to classify organisms. The thing about morphology, the statement, if they look like that animal, then they are that animal, is that convergent evolution doesn't abide by this rule. I mean, by that logic, wolves and hyenas, well, they look kind of similar. Are they the same kind of animal? Are they very closely related? No, not really. I just don't know if I'd consider these animals dire wolves. But I guess it depends who you ask. Love Dalen, a professor who is an advisor to Colossal, said, quote, There's no secret that across the genome, this is 99.9% .9 grey wolf. There is going to be an argument in the scientific community regarding how many genes need to be changed to make a dire wolf. But this is really a philosophical question. They also stated that it carries dire wolf genes, and these genes make it look more like a dire wolf than anything we've seen in the last 13,000 years. And that is very cool. The thing is, a part of the story is being a little bit ignored, and I think it's the most important part. I think the best thing about colossal bioscience is that the technology of gene editing can be used not only to, quote, bring back animals, but it can also help save animals that are on a collision course with extinction. A little while ago, I got to go to a wolf sanctuary and get face to face with a few gray wolves, but I also learned just how endangered red wolves are. I talked a little bit more about it on the podcast, but the technology that Colossal uses could actually be used to help increase the genetic diversity of the limited population's red wolves. In fact, Beth Shapiro even said in an interview with Scientific American, yields cells that are easier to reprogram than those that come from skin and could thus be a better way of diversifying the red wolf gene pool. And there was another quote from Colossal's chief animal officer in that same interview where he states, it's actually using technology to prevent species from going extinct. I think many people don't realize that a large part of Colossal's goal is conserving endangered species. They are hoping to reintroduce the white rhino and have developed vaccines for Asian elephants in captivity. I think these projects may not be as interesting. I mean, I had to search them to find out more, but on the other hand, the woolly mouse and the dire wolf blew up all my news feeds for a few days. And bringing back the woolly mammoth seems to take over headlines every few years. By the way, the colossal mammoth, if they do create it, will be kind of like the dire wolf in that it will be an elephant that is genetically modified to superficially look like a mammoth, altering genes to give it more hair, more fat, and shorter ears, maybe a few other things. Some have even started calling the hypothetical creature a mammothant. Anyway, I feel like the dire wolf and the woolly mouse are kind of like proof of concept, but also they as well as the mammoth and the thylacine, are pretty good at getting attention and entering the media circle. Again, a lot of other work they do really doesn't get much attention, even though it's very important. I'd argue more important. But you need investors, you need to capture the public's attention. And these stories are a bit of a masterclass in marketing. I don't really feel any cynicism or anger to the direwolf headlines, even though I might not consider them to be direwolves. I'm just glad Colossal gets more attention. There are many other foundations and charities that also do great work that I really wish were able to get their message out and get more attention the way Colossal does, but it's hard. The other thing is, these wolves, whatever you want to call them, what will happen to them? I was briefly chatting to the YouTuber Shark Toes on Twitter, great channel by the way, you should look them up, and he brought up some pretty good points about if they are adapted to their environment, and how would they interact with other predators and prey species? Good questions, and I don't really know, and I don't know if any of us know yet. But the wolves are currently in an undisclosed, fenced-off area. Apparently it's hundreds of acres large. 
and Beth Shapiro said they didn't have any plans to breed them further, which leads me to believe these animals will never be fully reintroduced into the wild, or introduced into the wild. I guess they're kind of new animals. I think that's probably for the best, since we are still trying to figure out if we should even reintroduce grey wolves back into certain areas, and that can get pretty controversial, so adding these genetically modified larger wolves into the conversation will probably only complicate things further, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Regardless of what they are, I hope these animals have nice lives and wherever their home is. Anyway, just a short video this time. Anyone out there ever planning to make videos about dire wolves? Look forward to all the comments you're going to get about colossal bioscience. But anyway, thank you to all my wonderful patrons and members, and thank you for watching.